I was kind of under the impression that with their format, they were really focused more on just Vegas entertainment as a whole, where it was more about yeah. like, all the different pieces. And it's live streamed. Yeah. It's live streamed, whereas this is edited because there's some stuff that happens you don't because see. Because musicians. Because <laughs> musicians. But also because I like to think I make a good product. You can't control a live stream as much. And besides, I live stream the, the Soul Belly. What do you want? So, you moved from Knoxville to Vegas? Yeah, so I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in the year of the DeLorean, 1985. The year of the DeLorean! <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local music scene and the people that make it, including me and this guy. And today, I've got something a little different for you. My guest today is a booking agent, talent buyer, and entertainment director booking some of the hottest shows in Vegas. Uh, his about section describes him as musician, concert promoter, Vegas, beard, glasses, wrestling, anime, life. He's the chief cat herder for Pulsar Presents. Please welcome to the channel, Patrick Pulsar. Say hi. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And I know it's Pol Patrick Pulsar Trout is the official name, right? Yeah, well, Pulsar is my nickname. It's not even actually part of I was going to say, no one names a kid name. Pulsar. No. <laughs> not even has a middle name, but welcome to the channel. Oh, you know what? Let's do this proper. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Rum! Salud. Salud. Wow, you weren't kidding. That's really good. That is good. Yeah. Mmm. That is really good. That's a... Mm. Bay Pig... Uh, Caribbean black rum. Not bad. Yeah, you were saying they don't make it anymore? No, they don't make Captain Morgan's Cannonball Blast. Ah. OG, uh, uh, you know, Room Sixers will know that I love me some Captain Morgan Cannonball Blast cold out of the freezer. But I went to go get some more and I had sad face. This is what I was uh, recommended by uh, Sandra a Total Wine. If you're watching, love ya. And it's not bad. No, I really like it. It's nice and smooth. It is. It, it, somehow it, it, it's warming. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Like, I would totally want this, like, when it starts getting cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Not bad. In the meantime, I'll get back to my Room 6 whiskey. Mmm. Gotta love that merch. Speaking of which, got new merch. I wore it just for you. That's cool. That is awesome. I would totally wear that. Cool. You can get yours at room6.shop. Hey. This just in. You can show your support for Room 6 by going to room6.shop after this video. We have tons of merch, including discounted cold weather merch and more. Whatever you need to show your support for local music and Room 6 is there, from shirts to hoodies to mugs to posters to stickers. Whether showing off that you're a patron on our Patreon page with our Two Brains One Bottle shirt, or reminding people to just be amazing, Room6.shop has what you need to be a friend of the channel. Thanks for supporting Room 6. Merch, merch! Anyway, merchandise! <laughs> so, you started off, I mean, you're a musician first and foremost, or you're not really doing the music thing anymore? So, I haven't played actively with a band in a couple of years. Um, I definitely miss it. I mean, playing music was a huge um, was a huge part of my life, and it's still, music is always going to be a part of my life for sure. Um, I have a lot of good memories from touring, but I really, especially post-shutdown when things started to come back, I kind of told myself that I really didn't want to spread myself too thin, so I really wanted to focus on the booking side of things first and kind of getting that dialed in first before I started playing. I mean, definitely if the muse strikes, I'll certainly, you know, want to play again, but uh, for now I'm focusing on the business side of it. Yeah, my wife and kid won't let me be in a band anymore, like because of the room, room six, and I'm just always editing or making content. Like, I love making content like this, but the editing. Well, I imagine a lot of people, like, I, I imagine that a lot of people who just, you know, watch shows and podcasts, you know, and just casually enjoy them, don't really think about just the sheer amount of yep. moving parts that go into making a show like this work and just the sheer amount of time that you spend editing and yep. compressing stuff and transferring things from device to device. I mean, it's a lot of work. It, it, you have to... One of the things about... the uh, Tangent. One of the things that I've learned being a YouTuber for almost four years now is you have to know... It's like a, being an artist. You have to know when to walk away. When to just say, okay, that's the... I, I have to stop and get this posted or it just I won't have a video up and I have all this other stuff you know and so because of the the, the niche that I found with this channel people have release dates and uh, like I, I go to Soul Belly Barbecue which we'll be talking about in a second uh, for the the songwriter showcase with Hal Savar and I live stream it and that takes care of itself you know you hit done and it's live streamed 
but I also do a review of it. And it's a weekly thing, so I have to get that posted by, say, Thursday or Friday, or it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's, it's definitely tough, especially when you're doing something, you know, when you're doing something independently. Um, I think a lot of people who go from, you know, from like, you know, the mainstream career field or whatever into doing something where they're doing it independently, I think the hardest part to get acclimated to is, you know, having to set your own schedule arbitrarily and also, you know, having to like set those deadlines for yourself. I mean, that's definitely something that I've struggled with over the years. I mean, as an independent booker, that's something I really had to dial in. One thing that honestly, I mean, I tell people all the time that honestly, like one of the things that helped me a lot as a promoter mm -hmm. actually was working a day job for a while because I was, I spent about three years working at Amazon in their warehouse oh. and it's, it's tough work. I'm not saying it's not, but you know, having that four ten schedule where there was an arbitrary schedule where I knew if I was going to get something done, I had to get it done within a specific time frame. Mm -hmm. It made me a lot more dialed in in terms of, uh, in terms of that, um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things too, also, especially when you're, when you're putting something together and you, you know, you're, you're coming at it from a place of wanting it to be as high quality as you can. Um, I think that's another thing that also is tough, like you were saying, where it's like, you don't, sometimes it's hard to know when to say, okay, it's fine. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, first of all, uh, I, I do work in a warehouse right now, but I actually, I mean, IT slash tech support awesome. and my customers are the pickers in the warehouse. So I have to be in the warehouse and right now. Tomorrow's forty six percent humidity. Oh no! Yeah, I never cared about humidity till I worked this. So, but we have a lot of people who. I moved to the desert for a reason. This I know, is right? Bullshit. <laughs> but but it's not. At least it's not going to break hundred tomorrow, supposedly. That's fair. But um, we have a, quite a few people who work in the warehouse who came from Amazon, and and mo they're generally they're, they're happier. You know, yeah. it was okay. like, well, you don't got to pee in a cup for anything, but it, it's. Or, I hear bad. I hear things, but I also shop on Amazon. I, I'm. Mm -hmm. I admit it, you're watching right now on something that was purchased from, well, that's not true, it was purchased from the phone store, but the lighting, the stands, was purchased from Amazon. I, I can guarantee you, uh, with rare exception, maybe eBay, and, and it's, it's one of those things, like, I also need to save money, because this is, this is my thing, and I'm not making anywhere near the kind of quitting my job money on YouTube. Right. Not for a long time, because I did what they tell you to do as a new YouTuber. Be niche. They'll find you. Yeah. I, nothing I make is viral. Yeah, there's, there's no you point know? in trying to be all things to all people, yeah. especially when, when, when the net is that wide. Right. I mean, that's something that I've run into on the booking side of things where, you know, I've had people say, well, why don't you try to book more like EDM shows or like certain styles of music that are more uh, mainstream? And I said, well, it's not that I don't want to or that I wouldn't have built the right show. It's just that there's already people doing those shows and doing them well. So there's no point in me being the fifth guy trying to put together a dubstep event if there's already, you know, four other great promoters doing it. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd much rather be the guy for the niche genres that other people maybe like but aren't necessarily going out of the way to try to bring to town. Mm -hmm. If I can fill that void, you know, market to market, I mean, that's really what I'm going for. Exactly. And it, to me, it, um, any creative endeavor really is a lot like finding your own musical voice. You're like, well, okay, I don't want to sound exactly like my favorite artists, but they're going to influence me no matter what I do. And it's true. Totally. Uh, and, and, it's, and, and they're doing it way better than I could. So what am I going to do that's me? And, and, and it can take decades to find that, if, but you, you stick with it. Same with, um, with YouTube. I've, I've managed to, you know, listen to people when they talk to you, uh, it's so easy when someone compliments you to just say, well, thanks, but, you know, it, the imposter syndrome is so strong with me. Yeah, I, I, I am not even, I made a video of it actually <laughs> here, um, but, uh, I, I just, I can't get over the fact that I'm still somehow in the music scene and, and, and in some ways more than when I was, you know, actually professional musician making money. Uh, it's professional. It's, it's weird because I, um, I mean, I feel more involved than I ever have, but at the same time, it's like, it blows my mind that I've been involved for this long. But I think a lot of it comes down to just, you know, I think a lot of times it comes down to really why you're in it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are a lot of people who get into all sorts of stuff for various reasons. Either it's, you know, stuff that, you know, their group is into or things that, or they feel pressured into it. Or it's just something that, you know, gives them a piece of enjoyment and happiness for a certain amount of time. And when it runs its course, that's okay. 
Right. And, and I, that's kind of one thing that I think sometimes people get really upset about people with irrationally for saying like, oh, well, you know, they, they, you know, they grew out of this or they phased out of it. It's like, that's natural. It happens. Like Metallica cut their hair. And? Yeah. I mean, I was like, yeah, I remember, I remember back in the nineties, like people being so upset about that as a kid. And I remember just being like, and like, you know, and like, you know, I'm like 12 years old and I'm like thinking, well, I thought load was good. And you know, some guy yeah. in his thirties being like, no, it's now, garbage. That being said. <laughs> I, I, no one made a fuss when Lenny Kravitz cut his dreads a little bit, you know. But you know, imagine say Bob Dylan comes out with with a homo- mohawk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like the fuck. <laughs> yeah. Well, shit, he tried to do an electric concert and his whole yes. band booed him off stage. That is yes. Um, but I digress. We digress. <laughs> There's a reason I have him on the channel, and he's not here to make music or to say I'm you know I'm playing this show. As I said, he's a booking agent uh, and an entertainment a director and a talent buyer, and a lot of musicians, especially new musicians to the scene or to their local scene, don't necessarily know what it really takes to get the venue, to get the shows you want to play. And I thought it'd be great to have him on here and talk about, you know, kind of some of the points you need to know, some of the things he wishes that musicians, you know, would, would remember or, or knew. And, uh, yeah, but also, it's it's not all, you know, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes of your, when you go see a show. And booking agents are a big part of it. Is it fair to call you a booking agent? Just um, I consider myself more, well, when I think of booking agents, I think, I tend to think of booking agent more as the, as the agent who's representing the artist. Um, as the, okay. um, as the promoter or talent buyer, I work with agents regularly in order to book events, but I do serve as a booking agent sometimes for acts if they're needing help with shows. And so I mean, there's definitely some overlap with the terminology for sure. Well, let's get, let's dig into that then. Uh, but first tonight, when you're watching this video at Soul Belly Barbecue, where the songwriter showcase happens on Sundays, uh, tonight is August 27th, Saturday. Who's playing? Uh, we've got an awesome show for you guys. Uh, we've got the Dirty Hooks, who are one of my all-time favorite Vegas bands made up of uh, absolute Vegas scene legends uh, who've uh, come together and put together an amazing project over the last several years. I mean, they've they've done some amazing tours. Uh, they've toured with bands like Stone Pilots, and they, to me, like, they're probably one of the best live bands you could see in Vegas. I mean... They're the sort of band where, like, they'll make you a believer in two songs or less. Like, that's oh, just I love how they bands. Are. Like, bands that you're like, somehow I know this music and I've loved it all my life. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And um, sounds like I need to get them on the channel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great lineup too. Uh, they're playing with uh, This Is Rogue Two, which is a new acoustic duo that's really cool. Wait, what's the name of the band? Uh, this Is Rogue Two. <laughs> right. Awesome name. <laughs> they need to do a show with the decaying <laughs> tigers. <laughs> just go from the eight bit to right to Star Wars. <laughs> That'd be perfect. Love the guys in Decaying Tiger. Oh, they're awesome. awesome. They, I shoehorned their entire thing, including speakers and stands and monitors and their own mixing board into Room 6. Very cool. Yeah, it was it was interesting. And, it, and that's why my lighting is now mounted to my walls. <laughs> and I needed some more floor. Frame. Nice. Anyway, you were saying. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, the, uh, the third act on the bill is uh, one of my favorite up-and-coming bands in the local scene right now, which is uh, Elephant King, which is a really cool uh, two-piece rock and roll band. They're really, really fun. So this um, is an all-local show? Yeah, it's an all-local show, which is uh, also a cool aspect of yeah. it. Uh, Soul Belly is actually, it's a really decent stage. Yeah, it's a really awesome room. It's probably one of my favorite rooms I've ever worked with in Vegas, yeah. to be honest with you. Because it, I mean, first off, the staff and the owner are fantastic. Bruce. Uh, the food, mm-hmm. yeah, Bruce is a great guy. The food is incredible. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm from Tennessee and my mom's from Alabama, so I'm a little biased. Oh, yeah, the, the, barbecue. the barbecue is legit. And I love that the, the menu is always... Slightly changing. Uh, I mean, they, they keep There's always like specials every day. They and... have guest chefs every so often come in. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I love... Anytime you walk in, the very first thing you see are two giant smokers. One yep. says big, and one says sexy. Yep. <laughs> you, you know you're in a good place. Exactly. Um, yep. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place to do shows. And one thing I also really love about the room is it's honestly one of the best sounding smaller venues in town. Oh, yeah. Because that's, that's one thing that a lot of artists have talked to me about in the past is that you know, they know that realistically their draws at a certain level when they come into town where they need to play a smaller intimate club, but they're still wanting the production level that they would get out of smaller clubs in larger cities like LA or Seattle or Austin. Because if you go to a 200 cap club in those towns, a lot of them are really dialed in sound wise. And it's been a lot more challenging, I think, to get that out here. But what I've noticed in the last, uh, what I've noticed post shutdown is, um, 
it seems like every all the venues that I work with are just coming out swinging in terms of trying to like do mm-hmm. what they can in terms of production, in terms of making the overall experience better for the people coming out to the shows. It's been it's been really cool coming back to this post shutdown because there's all these great new spots in town like Soul Belly, like Taverna Costera, like the usual place, uh, like Rockstar Bar. Where I was just going to mention Rockstar cool Bar. Happening. Yeah, you know Rockstar Bar, the sound the sound person uh, Bones built out the sound system there. Yeah, so he knows awesome. exactly exactly what to do. And and I, Bones I, has known me since I was about me <laughs> me. So yeah, so Bones is someone who's known me since I was first right. getting my foot in the door. You know, as a stagehand on right. call, and then. Yeah, so it's it's awesome to see what he's done over there. He's he's doing really cool stuff over there. It's awesome. Awesome. Uh, speaking of awesome, can I interest you in another shot, sir? Absolutely. Cool. Stick around. Be right back. We're gonna have a booze break. Booze break. Booze break. Ding. We're back. We're and back. Hey, happy belated birthday. Thank you, sir. Didn't think you'd sneak that by. Mm. I forgot to do the thing. Mm. We didn't do it the first time because you filled it very full. Ah. Ooh, that is. Nice. That's really good. Bay pig. Bay pig? Pig pig? Bay pig. I think it's pig bay. I think it's a bay of pigs. It's in the freezer. Um, Nummy interview just got more interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. So, first of all, happy belated birthday. Uh, You're what, 29 now? Uh, I wish. No, uh, I'm 37. I am less than a month past my 50th birthday. You don't look it. It burns! (laughs) And I just did the Room 6 Summer Showcase where I took all the gear and loaded all the gear and set up all the gear and and the heat. And I was like, man, I'm 50. I'm feeling it. I'm still feeling it. It, it hurts. And the next day I went to Soul Belly where I was just like, I got my camera bag and I got a bag of cords and I got a stand and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm at, the, I'm at that eight stage where I'm like, yeah, I'm not picking stuff up. Delegate, delegate, delegate. <laughs> well, one of the reasons why like, I, do so, I spend so much time on the videos... Uh, uh, outside of making the content for Room 6. One of the reasons why my family is like, no more bands for you. You're done. is because they also are tired of me loading gear at 2 in the morning in a bar. You know? Yeah, I can see that being in, in, being a bit of a drag. I mean, I, I, I've checked off some things on my list. Uh, like, I played the House of Blues. Hell yeah. I've had a kid in the front row and I say, can I get your pick? Yeah. And then he did, awesome. he did it to the next band. The next band found out. <laughs> that was a little bastard. And he's just like hedging his bets. You never know. <laughs> uh, um, or he's short on picks. But, you know, and um, I've had some cool things happen. But the coolest thing, I think, is that I can show up to a show in this town. And generally, somebody knows me. Not as Room 6, but as, you know, Josh. Yeah. You know, and, and it, 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 it warms the cockles of my heart to know that. I'm helping somehow the musicians in town uh, at least get a little bit more exposure on YouTube, which, you know, aside, uh, in the pit with Annie, I, I love your stuff. We want Annie's more. awesome. More stuff, please. Yeah, Annie's rad. Yeah. Um, and, and, and besides from her and me, uh, there wasn't too much going on on YouTube for uh, the local music scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know in the, I know Live with Ninon does um, kind of just all the music stuff. In Vegas, mm-hmm. but you could have a Michael Jackson impersonator on a show. I, I literally was there where uh, there was somebody who ran sound at the casinos, and then there was me. And yeah, I was, I was kind of under the impression that with their format, they were really focused more on just Vegas entertainment as a whole, where it was more about yeah. like, all the different pieces. And it's live stream. Yeah. It's live stream, whereas this is edited because there's some stuff that happens you don't because see. Because musicians. Because <laughs> musicians, but also because I like to think I make a good product. You can't control a live stream as much. And besides, I live streamed the Soul Belly. What do you want? So, you moved from Knoxville to Vegas? Yeah, so I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee in the year of the DeLorean, 1985. The and, year of the DeLorean! <laughs> and, uh, yeah, my mom and I moved to California when I was a youngin', and then we moved up to Vegas when I was 10. Ah. Uh, so, yeah, I've been in Vegas since 94. Um, I've worked in and out of L.A. for a few years, too, but Vegas has been home for the most part of my life, and uh, i Probably is going to stay home. Can I ask what part of California? Uh, I was in uh, originally in Orange County and then in Long Beach and then in Los Angeles. So it's kind of like one of those, like, you know, three cities. Three OC years, to LB to LA. All right on. Yeah. Right on. I, I only ask because I've lived both in Southern California and Northern California. And uh, it's always nice to hear somebody who's like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, Walnut Creek or whatever. No, for sure. Yeah, it's um, it was kind of funny because, like, we lived in LA during, like, the. We moved to L.A. during the probably the most tumultuous time of it in the 90s where basically like some of my earliest memories of 
being a kid in L.A. were the riots, followed by the fires, followed by the earthquake in 94. And after the earthquake in 94, my mom was like, let's go somewhere else. (laughs) Yeah. And then I was interviewing Scotty Dub, who you know. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing Scotty Dub back when it was Scotty Dub and Jellyfish. He was here with uh, Shay, Shy, his bass player, or the Mm -hmm. drummer. Uh, And when the earthquake hit, and this thing lifted, (laughs) and and he's like, what the hell was that? Because he'd never (laughs) been in one. Right. And I was like, that was an earthquake, and it shouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we don't get those here. Dude. So, yeah. When you come on room six, the earth moves. Hey. All right. <laughs> I'm so cheesy. So, you talked about being a ministry of love. You're the basis for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to know, like, what... If I remember right, Ministry of Love, you did some touring, right? Yeah, we toured quite a bit. We, uh, we, so, we started touring in... We started touring heavily in 2008, mm-hmm. and then we spent most of 2009 on tour. We did a 30-day run at one point, and then we did a two-and-a-half-month tour where we did the entire U.S. Uh, we did a couple of full U.S. runs in 2010, and then we did a shortened run in uh, 2013 after our record came out. But, uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time on the road. I'd say we probably did, I think we played like 44 states out of 50 at one point we tracked down. Okay. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It sounds like it. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're in that position in life where you can do that i'm not talking money i'm just talking like you can go away yeah it's a lot less about money than it is about freedom i mean we were we were you know scraping it together the entire time but it was one of those things where because we didn't have a lot of obligations holding us back at home like you know we weren't sitting on it's a lot easier to make those sort of you know decisions to hey we're going to go in the van for three months and even if we're only making you know 50 hundred bucks a night sometimes because that's another thing too is i mean like if you're going to be on the road that long you have to play almost every night and yeah. so you're going to play shows that are smaller or shows that are kind of eh but the thing is you also play a lot of towns that get overlooked so a lot of times in those smaller markets you can find people who are oh, really yeah. excited to get a band i've heard more than once in this kitchen that you know we play in town we're lucky to you know pay a bill or whatever we're lucky to make you know any sort of money and we go out of town even just to say hit the coast in california or whatever mm-hmm. for a weekend and we come back we're up after expenses five six hundred bucks you know right and, and it's just because of the oversaturation. That is something, if you're a Vegas musician, you need to realize. This town, it, it, it's full of musicians. It's full of entertainers. I think the biggest challenge that for any musician in Vegas trying to do it, whether you're doing originals or covers, is that at the end of the day, Vegas is a city with just as many things to do as Los Angeles, but with about a fifth of the people to market to. Right, but it's also more condensed. And it's also way more condensed. Yeah, so nobody walks in L.A., yeah. And you and I are both old enough to know that song. Yep. <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. Um, so I want to I want to shift a little bit more into promoter land now. Okay. What is that magic moment where you're like, this is why I got it? Like, what is? Do you have a, a favorite moment where you made a show, you put on a show, and you're just like, I can't believe I got this show. I can't believe this is going so well. Or, or something weird happened. What is your favorite show memory? Uh, let's see. I've got a few. Okay. Um... Definitely one of my favorite shows I've ever done was uh, Melt Banana at the Bunkhouse back in 2011. Ah, uh, the Bunkhouse. Wait, wait, which iteration? Uh, the uh, this was was you, this was this was pre Downtown Project. Was this with the Listening Tree? This was not with the Listening Tree. This the was, Listening Tree was, was a good idea. Yeah, it was a great idea. I loved it. But no, this was this was prior. This was in 2011. So this is yeah. prior to the renovations and everything. So this okay. is back when it was under the original ownership. All right. But um, yeah, I did a show there with Melt Banana, who's a really cool uh, grindcore band from Japan. And wait, um, wait. All that is amazing, what you just said together. <laughs> yeah. You just set it off. Yeah, you roll it out as one you sentence. Know, I'm from Japan. Oh, by the way, they're, no, they're, they're grindcore, which, yeah. you know, is apparently huge in Japan. Is it? Um, heavy music as a whole in Japan is very popular, but again, it's very niche. Mm-hmm. So it's like, the thing is with, with I feel like, um, and I, I don't know if it's necessarily a cultural difference or not, but it seems like when it comes to heavy music out there, uh, the people who are into it are really into it. And it's very much like, you know, right. a whole, like, it's like a whole lifestyle for them. And, but, um, but the other thing also is that it's also a lot more dialed in, like, like the way that like a lot of like American and like UK punk bands will kind of pride themselves on, you know, kind of being loose and sloppy sometimes Mm -hmm. you don't get that with Japanese bands. They are extremely disciplined. Like even like your Japanese punk and metal bands, I mean, they're practicing four or five, six hours a day. Right. It's an entirely different mindset. And and also it's, here's what we are. Yeah. This is not changing. This is who we are. If we're going to change, we are a whole other act. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's it's very much a, you know, this is what it is, and if you don't like it, listen to something else, versus, you know, where I think, 
I think artists, even in heavy music out here, feel much more of a pressure of like, okay, well, we kind of have to make it so that the people about the last album will buy this one, where, you know, a band like Boris, you know, they'll make an entirely different album every single time, knowing that their fans have enough faith in them to try it. Right. And honestly, I personally, as a songwriter, as someone who has tried different genre types without going totally out of my, my, my uh, wheelhouse, I respect, like... Getting that, you know, saying Metallica, and whether you love them or hate them, it takes balls to say, we are Metallica, and here's a country song. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and oh, by the way, we're going to play with a symphony. Which, by the way, I can still, I'm going to date myself again, Tower Records. I was standing in a Tower Records at a listening station mm-hmm. to it, Metallica s because I could. I, I, and I, I, I just... I listened with a smile on my face and just stood there for like an hour. That's awesome. And, and I still remember it. And then uh, a, a girlfriend at the time, late, like years, uh, not years later, but late enough that it was still relevant, but it was like Tower Records was still a thing. Um, and she worked for Tower Records at the time and got me, you know, I got, uh, got to meet Dido. Awesome. Which, yeah, that was Amazing performance, by the way. Um, but uh, also, she she got me the the double set of Metallic S and M, and you're not watching. I don't know what the hell you're doing. I've been married over twenty, or I've been married twenty years. <laughs> but but thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I can I get it back to you. Sorry, get it back to your point, no man. <laughs> I love that album too, by the way. Like that's probably actually one of my favorite Metallica yeah. records for that reason. It is. Four songs in, you, you barely even realize that the symphony is there. It just blends in perfectly. Yep. Like, I found myself, like, about halfway through the record being like, this just sounds like the songs always should have sounded. Like, it was weird to me. Like, yeah, it, like, it, like uh, Michael, what's his name? Uh, the, 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 the conductor? Yeah. Like, well, it was almost like, I remember, like, at one point, uh, Daniel Johns from Silverchair talking about the Neon Ballroom record, and he was saying that basically he felt like their first couple albums had been, like, these really cool, stark black and white pictures. And he felt like the third album was the one where they finally could splash color across it. This is Metallica we're talking about? Oh, well, I was just making a reference to, like, kind of the thought process. In oh, okay. terms of, like, um, you might want to cut that out. <laughs> but, yeah, what I was going to say is that... Uh, Lars, fuck you. <laughs> I still remember Napster, you son of a bitch. St. Anger would have been good if you just put solos on the damn thing or made the songs half as long. I liked the trash can snare. The trash can snare was, like, it was... I thought it was fucking cool. Again, it was like, what's that? It works. My thought with St. Anger was, it was like listening to a really cool fucking band yes. jam in their garage and you're listening through the door, but, wanting to see what they're up to. That's honestly or the rehearsal best way to, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, and, and if they had marketed it as that, right. they would have been oh, fine. When they did the, Marketing when, it as like a return to Master of Puppets and Ride the Lightning was a huge mistake. When they, when they did the, 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 whole, the, the album of cover songs, uh, mm-hmm. Garage Inc. Garage Inc. Yeah, I was going to say Garage Days. Garage Inc. I, the artwork, like the picture of them and everything, I was just like... Yeah, I can get behind this because you're not saying this is our interpretation. You know, we're not trying to like make it sound exactly like the cover. This is our their version of Lover Man. Oh yeah, God, still to this day makes me want to bone something. <laughs> I mean, like their version of Whiskey in the Jar is incredible. Their oh yeah, Diamond yeah. Darling is incredible. The version but, of the Misfit songs, period. But back like... to my outburst. My wife, from the day I met her, and and she said, and, and, and music started being a thing in my life. She said, if you're ever for some reason. At the point where you're at a party or at a thing, and Lars o- and Metallica is there, or Lars Ulrich is there, and I'm there, don't introduce us because I'm gonna punch him in the face. Because my wife is not a musician, but she's still oh Napster. And by the way, incidentally, guess what currently still pays the highest streaming rates to artists? What's that? Napster. It's still a thing. I'm on it apparently. You know, it's funny too because like I feel like with a lot of the you know it's like. The one thing that really came out of these last 20 years with everything was that the labels really screwed up from the beginning in the sense that the smartest thing they could have done when all of this started was put these kids in a room with them and said, how can we make money together? How does this tech work? How does the technology work? Because the problem was they weren't willing to ask those questions. They tried to do the same shit they did in the 80s where they wanted VCRs to go away. And And then you end up in a situation where basically the people who build the void weren't good actors, it was the tech yeah. bros. So that's why big tech runs music now. And and also the DIY is strong. Like you can make mm-hmm. a professional sounding album literally by yourself in your room. Yeah. You know you don't need to I mean when you, when you when you hire a producer at this point, what you're really paying for is the name. Well also or if you just I literally have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. 
uh, you know, I, 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 I know what I have in my head, but I can't, like, yeah, yeah that's what a producer is really, a producer and an engineer are really good at getting what's in your head or your heart out. Yeah. But if you happen to know what you're doing, yeah, you know there's no reason doing. to hire them unless yeah. you're just saying, like, you know. Yeah, um, there's a there's a lot of that. We've where, gone we've gone so many different rabbit holes. <laughs> they're gonna be stuck chopping this up so bad. I'm oh sorry. no, this stays in. <laughs> I, I do it live. Like I said, unless you tell me to cut something out in sincerity, it, I keep it in. For you, I as long as it as long as it as long as it makes sense for the flow of the yeah. video. I just don't want to like I'm I'm speaking yeah. off cuff here. I don't want to throw anything. Off. It's okay. We'll talk about punching Hitler later. Later, but don't worry about it. <laughs> well, why the fuck did I build a time machine? One of the best Doctor Who episodes ever. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> Hi-oh! From proudest moment... Huh? <laughs> reel it back in. <laughs> no worries, man. No worries. From proudest moment... Uh, what's your favorite mu music venue to just see a show at? Um, just to see a show as a fan? Um, that's a good question. Um, in Vegas... Um, mm. Sorry, in Vegas, yes. In Vegas, I would say... Um, I mean... You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the live experience that you get at a venue like House of Blues or Brooklyn Bowl is fantastic. I was just going to say House Brooklyn, of Blues. Yeah, yeah, House of Blues is a lot of fun. Brooklyn Bowl is really fun. Um, I have yet to go. Uh, Brooklyn Bowl is great. It's got great sound. Um, the food there is fantastic. That's uh, what I hear. It's got the bowling lanes. The cool thing about the bowling lanes is you would think that having the bowling lanes right to the side would mean that you'd be hearing I've, clanging and Now, bear in mind, I've only seen pictures online. You don't hear so, it at all. When you walk in, because all I've ever seen is the door, private party sign, mm -hmm. I can't go in, or... Quarantine. Thanks, COVID. Okay, so so when you go in, huh? what do you like? I need to do, I need to right, go so, and I need to do yeah. a venue review. So when you first walk in the doors, mm -hmm. um, you got the ticket booth to your left, and you got escalators to your right. The escalator. Oh, yeah. The escalators take you up to the second floor where the venue is actually at. Oh, so it's all upstairs. Yeah, it's all upstairs. That makes so much more sense. So yeah, there's I an upstairs heard. bar, restaurant. There's an upstairs patio balcony, okay. and then there's the venue side. Right on. But yeah, like for larger shows, that's a great room. Um, House of Blues has been a mainstay for years. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say in terms of smaller venues, um, like I said, we have some great new venues coming in. I mean, you've got your mainstays like Backstage Bar, but you've also got, um, and Dive Bar, but you've also got a lot of newer venues coming in like Taverna. Mm -hmm. uh, Taverna's a really cool, unique venue in that it's it's 150 capacity, so it's really intimate, right. but the bands play on the roof, so it's like this cool sort of rooftop party vibe. Right, you can always go downstairs, get some food, escape yeah. a little bit, get some air conditioning, and then that's, go back that's up. That's the nice thing about it, is that you know, you're, not, you're not stuck being immersed in the show if you want to get away from Play this. I was at Taverna Costera for the Gay CDC show. That was a fun show. Which is where we set this up. Uh, and that, I'm actually interviewing them virtually, uh, I think, later this week. Cool, awesome. Or next week. I yeah, those guys. Uh, but I was, I, for whatever reason, I think I had to go and get something out of my, my car. Mm -hmm. I go downstairs, I go outside the venue, I'm in the parking lot, and I can hear the lyrics clearer downstairs than I can up on the roof. Which to me, that, that speaks highly to me. That whoever's drumming the sound knows what they're doing, the, the whole sound system. Jeff, Taverna Costera is an awesome venue. Yeah, it's a great spot. Uh, I almost actually, uh, I was going, I was thinking about that place for my uh, my uh, Room 6 showcase, mm -hmm. but I didn't think I could do it just, I didn't think I could fill it, and I was, turns out I was right. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one thing that I think, um, that kind of leads into uh, something that um, I've been also kind of been trying to be conscious of with all the new venues is that a lot of it for me, you know, one of the bigger challenges post shutdown that's been kind of there for the last year has been, you know, not only seeing what the new venue situations are like in terms of which venues are available, but also kind of figuring out what exactly they're looking for. Because everyone's, you know, everyone's expectations are different and everyone's, you know, everyone's club is different. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, for me, I'm like, okay, well, I know that this will do okay in this room, but if I do it in this room, even if it does the same number of people, they're going to be really excited about it because it's a weeknight or because it's, you know, not a genre they normally get. Right. Um, or it's a band they're particularly fond of that they really just want to bring in. So that's definitely something I try to factor in. But one of the things I love about Taverna is because of that intimacy, you can have, you know, a smaller event there and have it still feel great. Like, there's a lot of rooms in town where you really can't do that. I think, I think one of the challenges that one of the things I think a lot of uh, a lot of bands and even sometimes our agents don't think about is it's like, you know, they'll want to get into a room because of the room's reputation or because of the room's name or because the room has good sound, but they're not thinking about the fact that okay, well, if it's a five hundred cap room and you bring seventy five people, it's that it's not feel it not yeah. just, it's not even just a matter of it feeling bad or looking bad. That's going to be a bad night for the venue, for their staff, for everybody involved. Right. So that's something that I'm really you know constantly trying to be cognizant of when I'm putting together offers is I want to make sure that it's it's a situation where everyone at least has a good shot at winning, not just the bands and myself, but the club, the staff, everyone. Okay. So speaking of offers, 
I wanted to actually let's break down a little bit, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. the process between from you know uh, how does it first start? How does a show start for you? Is okay. it um, you approaching a venue or a venue saying, "Hey, we have these dates open. What do you got?" Um, it kind of depends on the situation. Uh, most of the time, what I do is I approach a venue for a specific date once I've been hit up by an agent for an act wanting that date. Um, okay. So usually the agent will con the agent for the for the band will contact me first. This is a national act usually. Yeah, it's usually a national act. Yeah. Um, sometimes I do reach out too if there's a if there's a tour that I think you know could hit Vegas mm -hmm. or an act that hasn't been here in a while. I'll sometimes reach out to the agent saying, "Hey, are these guys riding through again?" Okay. But basically, usually the way the timeline works is I'll get offered a show by an agency. Once I see look at the, once I look at the artist and see if it's something I want to do, then I basically look at my venue list, see which venue it might make sense at. I hit up those venues. I usually hit up more than one just to give me some options and to give the agent some options. And then once I've got an idea of what my availability is like, then I put together an offer based on the capacity of the room and based on what I think the band's going to do draw wise. Um, the thing with building offers is you're, it's, it's essentially, you're basically, it's basically all speculation. You're basically having, you can go off of market history sometimes. Like you could say, well, I booked this band before and they did 200 people, or I saw this band play last year and they did 300 people. But Vegas is a little bit of a unique market compared to other towns because there is so many things to do and because there's so many people coming in and out of Vegas at any given time. You might have someone come to an event of yours and then six months later they've moved to another city for work or six months later there's a bigger thing going on the same night so they'd rather go to that. Right. Uh, part of my, not to make this about me again, but the summer showcase I, I did at Chiba, same night, or not Chili Peppers, a couple other big name bands were in town. Yeah. And, and I don't blame people. You know, it's like... Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, and it, it's always tough when you announce something yeah. cool and then like two weeks later something else yeah. is announced and it's like... God. But you see... Uh, especially new musicians um, or, or bands trying to build a following or, or just trying to get some shows, there's a lot that goes into it on the promoter side of things. That this is why it's important to, you know, build a relationship with one. Like you said, I know that this band is. I know that I want to work with them. Yeah, kind of thanks. And that's something that I've been really trying to do the last. Uh, that's really. I mean, something I've always been trying to do for years is keep those relationships going, especially with local bands. But. A lot of what I've been doing post shutdown has been. There are a lot of bands that broke up during the pandemic, and there were a lot of bands that formed during the pandemic, right. and basically had a good year and a half to do nothing but just practice and write. Oh yeah, and I've, I've and, had a few here that you're just like, yeah, and I've, I've yeah. and I've noticed that effects now because what wow. I what I've noticed coming back now is that the newer bands, it's not just that they are you know, bringing to their friends, it's that they are really dialed in sound-wise. Like, it, from compared to, like, you know, even, like, what I would have said maybe 10 years ago, it's, like, mm -hmm. it, it's it, like it's, a, it's a noticeable difference. There's this there's this X factor, and, and I'm sure we can quantify it if we try hard enough, but there's this X factor where as soon as a particular act will start playing, wherever the venue is, whoever's there, for at least a little bit, they're going to just be like, oh, yeah, I, and start paying attention. Absolutely, and then it's up to the act to kind of cultivate that, and and you know, that's the problem is that a lot of acts, especially the young ones, think we got to come out of the gate swing it hard, and we got to you know hit them hard, and then we'll kind of let it fold. The, you know, we'll do the softer stuff or whatever, and then we'll try to finish. And it's like there's a you got to gauge the crowd, and I think for you, what you do, you have to gauge also um, the the venue and the time of the the year. Absolutely. I, there's a lot of stuff I have to gauge. There's um, there's a lot of factors that go into whether I decide to do a show or not uh, beyond just money. Um, Can you break that down a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, it, a part of the part of the issue is I have to look at what else is going on. I, I keep two running calendars at all times. I have a calendar of the events I'm thinking about doing and a calendar of all the other events in town that are happening. Oh. Um, not just concerts, but things like major sporting events, trade shows, anything that might potentially keep my customer base from showing up. Or anything that might potentially bring a larger customer base in. I mean, perfect example, I keep track of the Raiders and Golden Knights games specifically so that, not so much so I can avoid doing shows on those same nights, because sometimes inevitably I'm going to get offered something like a national act where they need the same night as like a hockey game, and not everyone's going to go right. to a hockey There's only so many weekends. Yeah. You know? But at the same time, if I get offered something the weekend of a major event, and I can, you know, like, for example, um... Like, if the Raiders are playing in town on Sunday against the Patriots, and there's no major events going on that Friday and Saturday before, I might put together an event and not just market it to locals, but market it to people coming in from out of town, because 
whenever they play or certain teams come in to play the Knights, especially like original six hockey teams or teams from Canada, we get an influx of extra people. Yeah, we do. And there's a lot of acts that, you know, in Vegas, you know, they're going to play a smaller room. But if they played in some of these people's hometowns, they're going to be playing a much larger venue. Um good example of this was like about 10 years or so back, uh, Biffy Clyro played a show at Hard Rock on the Strip. And I remember going to it and the comments I kept hearing from people in the crowd who were mostly tourists was, I can't believe I'm seeing this band in a place this small because they're used to seeing them in the UK where they're playing arenas. Oh, they're from the UK. Yeah. So, so, been, so you left so, that part yeah. out. So, <laughs> so, for, so, for, so for their fans, you know, seeing them in, a, in an intimate, in mm. what in their mind was an intimate setting right. was really cool. So that's something that, and plus also, there's a lot of people who get to Vegas and then once they're, you know, done with like the one or two things they, you know, knew they wanted to do, they, you know. I want to go away from the strip now yeah, for a they, while. Yeah, they kind of get bored of it. Yeah. So, oh, they, believe me, I, I totally understand that. Um, you know, we, one venue we didn't talk about, mm-hmm. Evil Pie. Evil Pie is fun. I love, like, I love Evil Pie. I, I am the band. I'm sweating on you. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, you're yeah. that close. I had a really fun show there a few years back uh, that... Uh, with Ministry of Love, or, or uh, you, you booked oh, I, I, I booked a show there a few years back with. Um, uh, I was able to get Sushi Mamire from Japan added onto an existing show with Cleopatra. Uh, Sucker Punch helped out with that, which was really I cool. Feel like I saw that flyer. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it was an existing show that uh, Sucker Punch Concerts was putting on, and I'd asked if I could get them added onto the bill, and they were cool enough to do it. So it was, but it was a really fun night, and you know, again, that, that level of intimacy where like yeah. the bands were right in front of you is just great. And also, you're just like, if you're a national act, that's got to be also kind of refreshing. Yeah. It'd be like, even though we don't necessarily know you, we're right here, you're right here, there's the merch table. <laughs> you, know, yeah. like, you know, and, and, and you know, here, let's have some pizza. Um, and Evil Pie is just amazing pizza anyway. But, oh, yeah, um, it's fantastic. You heard about the Grasshopper thing, right? Oh, yeah, a couple of, when, the, so, when the great Grasshopper raid happened. If for some reason you don't know this happened, Vegas had a freaking Grasshopper plague or something? It, something like that. Grasshopper storm. And Evil Pie just jumped on us like... Now, they were sourced from Mexico. They weren't, like, just grabbing them you know, out yeah, there with a net. Yeah, I was out there with a net, just like, yoink. <laughs> but they literally have, a, or had, a grasshopper pizza. I don't know if they still do, but um, I haven't been there. Like, the, whenever I go to Triple B, I try to swing by Evil Pie. Same. It's, like, part of the deal. Yeah. But, um, all right. Oops. We're almost done. Oh, no worries. We've talked about kind of what goes into, you know, making a show, and, and also... Um, what what I'm trying to do is raise an awareness of what are promoters and booking agents and talent buyers, what do you do that musicians should know so that they can kind of come at you with, hey, we want to you know do this show or we know this band that's that's you know on the bill, we want to play that show, or hey, we have no shows, we would like a show, please, what do you got? And 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 what do you need from us kind of thing. So b- before we get into your like tips for that, mm-hmm. What's your pet peeves? Okay, well... <laughs> Let's crack um, this open. <laughs> well, I would say that the biggest thing that I would say to bands, mm-hmm. I would say this, and and this goes multiple ways, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. It's not... It's never the big stuff that gets on people's nerves. I think this actually applies to everything. It's never the big things that make people blow a gasket. It's the small stuff. It's the microaggressions, as they put it. Mm-hmm. Like, um, biggest thing is, you know, I would say is... Um, you know, not overbooking yourself. Um, one thing that is really challenging is, you know, obviously when you're in a band, you want to play as much as you can because you don't get better without playing live. But at the same time, if you're playing every week, it becomes a lot easier for your friends and your fans to say, well, you know, I could see him this week, but yeah, we've, uh, we've all been Marvel that. movie coming out. Yeah. I'll go do that this week. And next week, maybe I'll go see him. Especially if you're a cover band. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's especially tough in that case. Yeah. Um, so it's, so it's hard in that sense. Um, But, and and like I said, I understand the urge to want to play, but I mean, to me, it's like, I feel like, you know, the first year or so you're a band, I think playing every few weeks is totally fine. I think once you've hit that one year mark, you know, at that point, it shouldn't just be your friends and family coming out to see you play. You should have people who are getting into the band simply because they like the band. Right. Um, If that isn't happening after a year, at that point, you might want to look at retooling some stuff. Not, not because it's, and the thing is, a lot of it also depends on what you're wanting. I think that there's this kind of weird sort of like, there's bands who strictly are just doing it for the love of music and, are for, and for fun and they just want to do it as a hobby and if that's all it is for them, that's totally fine. There's also bands that are really serious and dialed in and want to treat it like a business and want to, you know, make it quote unquote and that's also totally fine. 
There's also a lot of bands in the middle where they they want the stuff that they associate with making it, but they don't necessarily, you know, but it's like, but they still kind of want to treat it like a hobby and kind of treat it like it's just yeah. fun. I just want to have fun, man. Yeah, it's like, and, and the thing is, like, I understand that, and the thing is, I think a lot of, I think where most bands break up or don't work out is when they reach that middle ground and they don't really know where they want to go from there. Because, yeah. because I mean, the thing is, like, don't get me wrong. I mean, like, I look at it like this. I mean, you know, I'm not expect. I mean, when I when I when I book when I book a show with a local band, I'm realistic, especially if I'm booking them on a weeknight or something. I'm not, you know, I don't. First thing is, I don't expect the local band to do all the promotional work for the show. I'm the promoter. That's You're my a job. Rarity, by the, the bucks, way. The buck stops with me on that. I yeah. mean, my job is to promote the show to the general public. Mm-hmm. If the general public does not know about the show, that's not on the bands. That's on me. At the same time, it's not my job or any other promoter's job to make people care about your band. Right. That is something you got to make happen, and you got to make it happen with your live show or with your community engagement building, or something, yeah. community building, all of that. So, um, I mean, the thing is, like, I've had times where bands have been like, "Well, what are your requirements for playing?" And I've literally just been blunt. I've been like, "Be on time, bring your friends, have a good attitude, and don't suck, and show up." Yeah, and and that's another thing too. Like that's that's. Yeah. That's a big thing. It's like if you, the thing that I think you have to keep in mind sometimes is that even if music is just a fun hobby for you, running a bar is not a hobby. Yeah. Running a club is not a hobby. Yeah. Being a bartender is not a hobby. So it if you don't fulfill your your obligations or if you don't do what you say you're going to do, it affects all of those people in a much harder way than it's going to affect you if it's just you know something you're doing for fun. But that, but again, I, like I said, I think there's I think there is kind of a tendency to put put all of this on the band saying, oh, well, you know, if the show does bad, it's the band's fault, it's this or that. And I think there isn't enough, I think it's not a matter of playing the blame game. It's a matter of saying, okay, well, how, it's like, my attitude is between myself, the bands, and the venue, I'm going to make it a good show. Right. And all of those things have to be in place to do that. So it's just, it's a matter of making sure that you've got, you know, that you're, anything, whatever responsibilities you've taken on for the show that you're handling. So, if I'm the promoter for an event, I know that there's a base amount, a minimum amount of marketing that I'm going to do. There's a minimum amount of a marketing budget I'm going to have. I'm going to probably spend more depending on the situation or if I can get a sponsor. Mm-hmm. I know that there's certain physical promo that I'm going to do. I know there's certain digital promotion I'm going to do. I know that I'm responsible for making sure that the production team knows what they're supposed to be, that the run of show is, is communicated to everyone. I'm responsible for making sure that the venue knows what's going on. So there's a lot of individual responsibilities that go with putting on a show just like there are individual responsibilities of playing a show or working at a show. So it's just a matter of just making sure that your own stuff is handled and making sure that, you know, people know what is expected of them too. Last question. You made it. And normally mm-hmm. with acts, with yeah. musicians, I say something like, let's talk to little you. Let's pretend we're talking to a new musician. What is that one piece of advice you wish someone had given you before you got into the music business or whatever? I'm not going to have ask you that. Okay. I'm going to say, what is your number one tip? Like the number one thing besides show up, you know, what is the number one thing that musicians might not know they need to know about getting the shows that they want to get? That's a really good question. That's why I ask it. Um, I think there is, and I, and I noticed this, especially post shutdown, there was kind of this weird sort of like communications gap between Artists wanting to play shows and venues wanting artists to play their club. Where a lot of the venues I talked to were like, hey, well, do you know what bands to talk to? Because we don't really know. And I had bands that I would run into who'd be like, yeah, we've been hanging out at this club for like a half hour and we don't even know who to talk to about getting a gig here. Oh, so, there's this, so there's this kind of like weird, there's this weird communications gap. But I think that over the last, there's kind of this mindset that a lot of people have that basically promoters serve more as like a middleman or a barrier to entry for getting your band to show. So they don't see it as like, Hey, this is someone who can, you know, help our band. They see it as someone who's there to basically tell our band no. And, yeah. and that's, and that's a bummer, but, and yeah, at the corporate level, it kind of can get, get that way. I mean, that's one of the reasons I had you on is I know from experience, I may have even said it in the years past as a musician, you know, like God damn promoter, you know, they didn't, you know, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 book an agent or whatever. And I wanted to kind of dispel some of that, but I also wanted to know, like you said, a lot of musicians think I got to go talk to the venue owner, or I get who does the, you know, who who books yeah. the music for your your venue, 
And then, meanwhile, yeah, they got like talk to Patrick or you know. Well, I think a lot of that too is um, I think a lot of people figure that they're going to get a better deal if they go direct with a club, and yeah, sometimes you can, but you're also at the mercy of the club not trying what does to the venue owner care about. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you're also at the mercy of, you know, whether or not the venue owner is going to know how to market a show, whether they're going to... Because the thing is, most clubs, they have individual people who do these things or they outsource it. They don't necessarily do it all in-house. Um, I mean, most venues don't have an in-house booker. They basically have a calendar that someone manages and then individual promoters will come to them with individual stuff on a case-by-case basis. Um, I think the biggest thing is... I think the best way to get in with promoters is to just honestly to make them aware of you. And the best way to do that is, you know, networking with fellow local bands that are like minded and setting it up so that basically you can go to a club or to a promoter and say, hey, we've got a full lineup ready to go of like three or four bands. Or we got like, you know, we got these two bands that are down to play and we just need to find a third if you're down to help with that. But using that as a way to get your foot in the door is great. And also... Um, I mean, me personally, I go out of my way to try to vet bands. Like, if a band tells me, hey, we're playing a show and it's a band I haven't seen yet, I'm going to do my best to go and check them out. I've, I've even had times where I've, you know, had bands invite me out to the rehearsals just so I could, like, see what they sound like before I put them on something. And that's actually a really smart idea as, a, yeah. as an act is, yeah, because, you, you know, again, who do you want in your corner? You want the person who can get you the shows. You don't necessarily want the one venue owner, if, if you can... Yeah. Yeah, so if you love that band, you're going to go out of your way to, like, include them where they, where they make yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. Once I, once I find a band that I believe in, I'm going to do whatever I can to help them out where I can. I mean, that's... And that's the thing. Most... In the, the thing with independent promoters is we all got into this because we love music. And we're all still in it because we love music. So right. we're going to be a lot more emotionally invested. It's a lot more personal for us. I mean, when you're doing shows at, like, the corporate, like, arena and Normodome Dome level... You really can't be that personal, even if you want to be, because you're dealing with too much money and too many logistical things and too many things where basically you're stuck saying no to people that you really don't want to say no to, but you have to because, you know, you're a publicly traded company. Right. When you're an independent actor, you can kind of, you know, take it on a case by case basis and, you know, focus on, you know, what individual needs the individual show or the artist has. I mean, that's one thing that I really like about being independent is that, you know, I don't have to say yes to things I want to say no to. I'm not stuck saying no to things I want to say yes to. And if I take a shot at something and it doesn't work out, the buck stops with me. I learn the lesson and I move on from it. I'm not, right. you know, it's not a matter of, you know, making a mistake and then, you know, having to deal with people above you yelling at you about it. It's just a matter of, you know, oh, well, that didn't work. Back to the drawing board. Nice. Um, and honestly, I couldn't say it better than that. Basically, the synopsis is, that's a college word. <laughs> In, in more ways than one, you know, reach out to your local booking or promoters and say, you know, hey, what do you, you know, what do you got or what do you need from me? And uh, if you commit to something, be reliable. Yeah. And the thing is, and also, and I will say this, that is 100% a two-way street. If you're not, if you're a band and you're not getting what you need out of the promoter or the club, mm-hmm. you know, call them on it. You yeah. know, not like in like, you know, not like in like the, not like, you know, like, no, don't get mad about it after the fact, but like, you know, if, if, you know, if it's, if it's a week out from the show and you're still waiting on information, you know, shoot them a message, you know, be like, Hey man, you know, we're trying to put on a good show for you. We want to make sure this happens. And yeah. cause I mean, I think that, I think that there definitely is a little bit of a, and I noticed this, I noticed this, especially coming back post pandemic where. I think there was a level of complacency that had built up pre-shutdown as far as, like, what it took to promote a show in the sense of, like, oh, well, you know, I can just do digital. I don't have to do physical marketing. Or I can just do this. I don't have to do that. Well, I know, like, the first week or two, any show, you didn't matter what you did, it was packed. Oh, yeah. There was, like, there was definitely a honeymoon period. I mean, like, the first, like, that summer of last year, I mean, it was, like, the first two months, everything was selling. And then all of a sudden in August, once um, the new string picked up, um, and people started running out of money. It was like, <laughs> it, it was like, it, it just, it was like someone turning a faucet off. It was, nice. it was almost instantaneous. And the other thing also is I think a lot of consumers are very hesitant to buy pre-sales right now to shows because of the fact that there are a lot of people who bought tickets to shows in 2020 that are still waiting to get their money back for shows that Ooh. might or might not happen yeah. because the shows are postponed and basically, you know, yeah. so, so that's, that's something that, you know, that's something that, you know, Kind of, there's a certain amount of uh, trickle down economics to this, where it's like, 
you know, decisions that, you know, the big two make kind of affect independent promoters too, because most people don't think of, you know, this in terms of individual companies. Someone who just wants to go see live music is just thinking of it as the promoter. They're not thinking of it as Live Nation or AEG or this independent guy. Definitely. Um, I'm actually going to wrap up there because apparently my kid wants a snack or is packing lunch or something. But uh, the joys of filming in your own home. Not a green street. See? So I want to thank Patrick Pulsar for coming on the show. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank my kid for uh, being amazing. Chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggies. First day of school, straight A's. Awesome. <laughs> In the meantime, definitely, definitely consider hitting up your local booking agent and start our promoter with Polestar Presents. Put on some amazing shows. Uh, again, thank you for watching. I hope that this helped a little bit. If you want to see more videos like this, please click up there. If you'd like to subscribe, please click down there. Don't forget to ring the bell. Remember to be amazing, and we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say goodbye, Patrick. Goodbye, Patrick. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba